I'm feeling a bit guilty because I've come in to kind of flash mob this lecture, a flash mob of one. Um, but I just wanted to say how proud I am of you to do, running this series of lectures on International Women's Day to celebrate the, the, um, the great achievements of our wonderful women in Cardiff University. It's absolutely fantastic. Those who don't know who I am, I'm Karen Holford, I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor. And by um, discipline, I'm an engineer, so I, and I've sort of grown up at Cardiff University. Cardiff University has supported me throughout my career, and um, from you know lecturer to deputy vice chancellor now. So I've come to introduce Emma's talk. So lovely to meet you, Emma. I'm sure you're going to have an interesting talk, and unfortunately, I can't stay and listen to it. I'd love to, but I'm, I'm going to. You're filming, so I'm going to hope to watch all of them afterwards. Thanks. What I really wanted to say was, on International Women's Day, we've been thinking of how we can help people. And in my career, I know I've been helped by people. And sometimes they're called mentors, but actually, it's not about being a formal mentor. It's about looking around you and seeing when somebody can do with a little help, a little hand up, or a little you know, word in the right direction. I, throughout my career, I've been helped by people who've intervened at the right time to say, keep going, you're, you're being wonderful, or you know, you can do this, or you know, why don't you give a talk for us, and you know, promoting my my skills and so I wanted to ask the whole of Cardiff University to join me in doing this and to say to me I will do this and so on Yammer in the all staff network in the all staff thing on Yammer I put out a call to everybody to say I will do this and it's getting some momentum now I've also put out a call on Twitter so that it's not a hashtag it's just a, a pledge to say I will do this and so if you read them it's just about helping looking around for a, a female colleague at any stage of their career who you can help them in a little way or a big way up to you but just thinking about somebody who you can help by a kind gesture or something like that, a word of encouragement. So I'm just calling on you to say in your head, I will do this and then commit to it, okay? So thank you. So I won't take up any of your time. Um, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. Fab, um, so hi everyone. Um, as you've heard, I'm Emma. Thanks for coming along today um, to my talk. So I thought it'd be really nice today, um, as the kind of last speaker, just to talk about my kind of journey um, from PhD student here in Cardiff and actually undergraduate student here in Cardiff as well all the way through um, to research fellow. So um, I actually did my first degree here um, and had some of the lectures in this room. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree in biochemistry. Um, and when I started my degree, this lovely building wasn't even built, they were still um, building it. So um, I finished my uh, undergraduate de degree in 2012. Um, and then after I finished, I think I kind of maybe looked a bit like this, um, was a bit unsure what to do next. And I think um, many people are when you finish their degree. There's loads of options. And I think having a degree um, in a science subject gives you loads of options, which is a really nice thing. But sometimes um, all of those options can maybe actually be a bit overwhelming. Um, and also, at this time, it kind of um, started on a few kind of rejections. So up until this time, I'd done quite well at school got into my kind of first choice university um, and then I decided I wanted to start applying for PhDs. So I put probably, I don't know, 10, 20 applications in um, and I heard back from some, unfortunately, with rejections. Um, others I didn't necessarily hear back. Um, but fortunately, after a few, um, I was successful in um, being awarded a PhD uh, working in the School of Biosciences here um, with this great chap called uh, Professor Stephen Dunnett and the PhD was basically characterising a mouse model um, of Huntington's disease kindly funded um, by the MRC. So the PhD um, was, was great. Um, I was in a really um, great lab and really fortunate to have the support of those around me. Um, and that was also one of the key motivators in choosing that specific PhD over any others. Um, so I graduated in July um, of 2016 with my PhD. Proudly my, my thesis is there. Um, and then after the PhD, um, quite a, a similar um, decision really. So my PhD was on Huntington's disease, so I wanted to tell you a bit about that in case you're not really sure um, what Huntington's disease is. So Huntington's disease is um, a neurodegenerative disease, so it affects the brain. Um, and unfortunately at the moment there's no, I don't like using the word cure, but there is no um, treatment that will prevent the disease 
kind of from happening, um, which means it's incurable and unfortunately fatal. Uh, it does get worse over time, so typically from about 10 to 15 years um, from clinical diagnosis, um, it will get progressively worse over time. And the interesting thing about Huntington's disease is it's a genetic disease, it's an autosomal dominant disease, and that means if you have the gene for the disease, you will 100% um, unfortunately get it. And it also means that if you carry the gene, there's a 50% chance that you might pass it on to your children. Um, so Huntington's disease is really a model genetic disease and although originally it was kind of described as a motor disease, you might have heard of it called Huntington's chorea, um, that was because it was originally described looking specifically at the motor symptoms which are very obvious, um, called chorea which is a kind of jerking and shaking movement. So the motor symptoms, um, the chorea, rigidity and tremor, they occur quite actually quite late in the disease. And as we've understood more about the disease, we actually now know that there are significant cognitive and psychiatric symptoms as well. So we often now refer to it as a, a triad of symptoms. You've got your motor, cognitive and psychiatric symptoms. But actually, um, when you kind of talk to patients who have the disease, it's the cognitive and psychiatric symptoms which significantly affect their lives, probably more so than the motor symptoms that they'll develop later on. Um, so this led me to kind of refer back to my PhD kind of topic um, and I was quite interested in characterising a mouse model based on the cognitive symptoms that it displayed. So I was quite fortunate to publish um, quite widely from my PhD looking at this mouse model and basically determining whether it reflects the human condition of Huntington's disease accurately. Um, and probably the kind of key standout finding was that if we give uh, the mouse model of Huntington's disease that I was looking at cognitive training, we can see that that um, can modify some of the disease symptoms that we were observing. Evidence in mouse models um, showed that cognitive training could potentially improve things. So I published on this and another group did at the time. So we had proof of principle um, in mice that this cognitive training could modify the cognitive symptoms but there was also some suggestion that it might look to modify the motor symptoms as well so across the two um, symptom domains there um, and you might well ask well how do you give um, a mouse cognitive training um, so i'll show you through a little animation next to it so this is a uh, kind of animation um, of a behavioural task and we use these operant boxes to train the animals. Um, so this is what the animal will see, an array of nine lights um, and in this task we would only ever use five of them and you can kind of see them all lit up there. So the, the middle light will light up there, the mouse recognise that and is then trained to go and poke at it and for doing so um, should receive strawberry milkshake reward. So that's how we train the animals. So they associate a successful nose poke with obtaining um, a reward in this case. And then we should see the location of the light changes um, and then pokes correctly and then gets some more strawberry milkshake reward. So in that task they were uh, looking at the array of lights and poking correctly. So if you've ever been to the fun fair and there's those like, light shows you can kind of test your reaction time bit like that um, but for mice and so in terms of the clinical translation of this work um, we knew that cognitive dysfunctions occur quite early on in the uh, Huntington's disease process and in other diseases Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease there's quite a substantial body of literature um, that cognitive training could improve cognition um, however at the time I finished my PhD, there weren't any studies that looked specifically at cognitive training in Huntington's. Um, so I kind of came up with the idea that if we gave disease relevant cognitive training that we could potentially have some kind of non-pharmacological um, intervention for um, Huntington. Um, it was at this time I kind of finished up my PhD um, and again this face was probably um, described the way I was feeling, I wasn't really sure what to do again. Um, I think that's a kind of running theme. There again were lots of options um, and 
the rejection came back, so put a lot of job applications in, wasn't successful. And I think um, that was a theme I kind of wanted to get across through this talk, although it's great to talk about the successes, um, quite rightly. Um, I think it is important to reflect the truth of, you know, the whole, um, the whole of what goes on. So there have been a lot of successes, but also a lot of kind of learning points as well. Um, so at that time, I was fortunate to put in quite a lot of grant applications, um, some of which were successful, some of which weren't. Um, but after an interview and quite a lot of um, waiting, I was um, successful in getting a, PhD, a fellowship project after my PhD, um, funded through Health and Care Research Wales. Um, and I was quite kind of early coming out of my PhD. Um, there were kind of suggestions that maybe I should have waited before putting the fellowship application in, maybe I should have waited for more papers, etc. Um, but I kind of thought, give it a go, what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, and it kind of paid off. So the fellowship project was using this idea that we could give computer-based cognitive training um, to people who are affected by Huntington. So um, this kind of study was born, um, we called it Cogtrain HD. Um, so Cogtrain HD is the translated human equivalent of the animal brain training. Um, and this is a feasibility study that looks at a 12 week um, computer game brain training program um, and whether that might provide any benefit. Uh, and that is supported by home visits and also email or telephone reminders um, as the participant prefers. Um, and funded through the fellowship but also through some other funding, the Jacques and Gloria Gosweiler Foundation who gave us some funding um, to look at the mechanism potentially behind this using MRI um, imaging. So, um, I wanted to show you an example of the email reminders that our participants receive and the games that they actually play. So, in this study we have a control arm and those people um, don't receive any brain training, they're asked to continue as normal for 12 weeks. And we have the intervention arm where they receive this brain training. And um, for three 30 minute sessions a week they'll receive these emails um, and they have a link in there that says start my workout and they can click through and it will take them to their um, workout and these are just kind of screenshots of a typical example. So this is level one of this exercise. Um, the instructions are relatively simple, this is something we're looking to establish whether this is feasible in this group. So click all four bubbles as quickly as possible, beginning with start, ending with finish, advancing in alphabetical order. Um, there's the example and the participant would need to join the bubbles up in alphabetical order to do, um, to do so in that task. And once they've done that task, they go on to another, and this time they have to alternate between letters and numbers. This is a version of a task called the trail making task, if you've um, heard of it, but it's an online version. Um, and here they have to begin with a letter, then go to a number, then a letter, then a number. So slightly more advanced than the first task. And then um, at the end of the task, you receive feedback on your performance, uh, how accurate you were, how many errors and your response time. Um, so within the program, you will receive feedback on performance. Um, through a graph, but also through kind of motivational and encouraging messages as well. So the primary aim of this study is to establish feasibility. So this approach had never been used uh, in Huntington's before. So we wanted to look at quantitative, but also qualitative measures. Um, so as part of the study, we're interviewing participants and their family members about how they found it whether they thought the brain training games were good and how they found the study kind of generally. Um, alongside that we're looking at kind of secondary measures of cognitive assessments, motor assessments and questionnaires to get preliminary evidence of whether this brain training might um, produce any beneficial effects in these people. Um, and also as I mentioned the uh, MRI to look at kind of mechanistic underpinnings of what might be going on in the brain. Um, so really what I kind of proposed was to go from the animal model um, into the patient clinic, um, which was quite a kind of novel um, way of doing it and I think I kind of wanted to reflect on the fact that making that transition was literally a whole new world. 
Um, it was a, quite a big um, jump to make um, from the lab to the clinic, um, but I am kind of really glad um, that I made it. And they are, it might seem obvious to say, but very different approaches going from the lab um, to the clinic. The guiding principles are the same, um, I think in terms of study design, a lot of the transferable skills um, that I certainly developed. Um, yeah, the transferable skills, but probably most importantly the resilience. Um, and I think resilience is a word that kind of can be overused, um, but building that up, particularly from an early stage, I think is um, really quite important. Um, so it was a big step, and Karen at the beginning mentioned the kind of importance of um, mentoring. And again, I think um, the word mentoring can kind of be thrown around a lot as well. Um, but on a kind of personal level, I've benefited hugely from that in a um, kind of professional capacity, but also in just a kind of people helping you out, you know, looking through drafts of grant proposals, things like that. And that can be... Um, you know, hugely beneficial. I certainly wouldn't have got um, where I am today without that support. Um, particularly when I change topic um, and having experts that can advise you in the approach that you're taking is, um, for me, it was really important. But I have uh, no doubts that there are more challenges to come um, and hopefully I can kind of give back to people who are kind of progressing now, PhD students and things like that. Um, in terms of the mentoring kind of programs and schemes. Um, so that was kind of my research journey and I just wanted to end by focusing on some of the kind of engagement and outreach activities that I do as well. Um, so quite a shameless plug for the Brain Games which are happening on the 18th of March uh, in Cardiff Museum. This is an annual event which showcases all the uh, neuroscience research that we have going on in Cardiff. Um, and last year we had about 3,000 people come to the museum, so it's a huge undertaking, um, but really enjoyable. Um, also getting involved in um, the Set for Britain event, which is now the STEM for Britain event, so going to Parliament to present my research. Um, and actually these were all things that I kind of got involved in during my PhD, um, alongside all the research, and I think as kind of PhD students and students it can be quite difficult to manage your time but I would recommend if you can um, do get involved because you'll you'll benefit from it hugely um, and then there are just a few kind of other examples of science writing competitions maybe if you didn't necessarily like talking in public things like that um, I'm a great fan of using Twitter and social media to promote research um, but yeah so I just wanted to highlight the importance um, that engagement and outreach has had for me personally I certainly don't think that I would have um, been able to present to a fellowship interview panel um, in the way that I had without presenting in Parliament and things like that. So although um, engagement and outreach activities and the main reason people kind of cite for not being able to do them is a lack of time, I would kind of think a bit wider about that and how much they can pay off kind of long term in the future. Um, so finally just a few thanks really to all the kind of centres and departments I've worked at and for um, through the years in Cardiff. Um, and to my mentors um, for their help and also my mentees because I think that is a two-way relationship, I genuinely do, and all the colleagues that I've worked with. Um, and finally just the MRC for originally funding that PhD, uh, Gosweiler Foundation for an initial postdoc grant and then Health and Care Research Wales um, funded through the Welsh Government for my fellowship award. So that was a kind of whistle-stop tour of my um, journey, and yeah, I'm happy to take questions.